Uh, every man that asketh the reason for the hope that lieth in you. And uh, we're going to try to pick up where we were at a couple of weeks ago. I'll take a minute here and uh, try to bring you up to speed. I had last week's notes, but um, <clears throat> bear with me one second. And we're talk we were talking when we... Uh, last met on this. We had Greg Wagner here. I was out of town last week, so he missed a couple weeks, but we were talking when we last met on this, and if I could get one of those, if we have any left, that would be helpful. Yes, yes, ma'am, I'll turn on my microphone. I think we've almost got it together here. Have we got enough for everybody? Did anybody not get one, needs one? Okay. Here, did Will, did you and Bobby Joe get one? Yeah. Okay. Was there anybody who didn't get one? Ah, oh, Huey, Dewey, and Louie back there. Uh, here, take this to them and uh, figure out which one of them can read. And... Um, <clears throat> here, go ahead and do that. I'll, I'll just work on it off my iPad. That's fine. Thank you. There you go, guys. Thank you for being patient. So let me remind you of where we were at last time that we dealt with this issue of a kind of apologetics. And we've been looking at sort of the core things. We're going to begin to look at, uh, as I told you a few weeks ago, how we uh, deal with um, others uh, directly, how we might deal with them. So we talked a month or so ago about uh, sharing the gospel with Jewish people and some things about that. It's been a little while ago, and we're going to do uh, more of that as, as the next uh, few weeks unfold uh, as we uh, just deal with this idea of giving an answer to everyone who asketh the reason for the hope that lieth in us. The t last time we met together, we asked this question, who is Jesus? And we looked at a few things. Here's the first thing that we saw, and that is, you know, that truth is always truth. And the, the reason that we said that is this, in this process of kind of trying to build a foundation for uh, giving an answer, we've been looking at the nature of God, the character of God, because really most of our answers, or many of our answers, lie in who God is. And there's constantly, for those who would deny the existence of God or even want to attack the existence of God, there's always, an, there's always a, a direct shot at the character or nature of who God is. And so as we saw when we did sort of a Q&A, that's been a couple months ago now, uh, most of the questions were answered based upon uh, the, the char character or characteristics of God, his nature, his attributes, his, uh, his holiness, and all of those things. We did learn in all of that study that uh, about, about that there's one God, right? One God, and uh, yet there are one God in three persons. We understand the unity of God, uh, the Hebrew word echad, right, which means a, uh, often means a multiple uh, uh, of one. In other words, one in unity, for instance. Uh, uh, and God said, let us uh, make man in our image, right? He's talking about a compound uh, unity there, right? So it wasn't three gods, it was one God. So let's make sure we got this. There is one God. Everybody understand that tonight? One God. One God and only one, right? And, um, and he declares it. He says in the book of Isaiah, hey, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, all right? I look around, Isaiah writes, and I see no other God. There is one God, but there is also three persons or essences in one. First John chapter five and verse seven, we saw this, that, that there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father the Word, capital W, that's Jesus, right? Uh, and uh, the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. And so we understand when we begin to look at Jesus that, uh, that Jesus is very God. That He is God uh, manifest in the flesh. That when He came, He's completely God. Uh, He's completely God today. He has always been completely God. The Father is completely God. The Son is completely God. The Holy Spirit is completely God. They're all eternal. Uh, they're all, uh, they are all uh, uh, essence. Some would say personality within the one God. But there's one God in three persons. And then we looked at some false views of Jesus uh, when we were in this a few weeks ago. 
and we talk about a few, I'll remind you of them, or maybe you can remind me. Someone tell me what we learned that Islam teaches about Jesus. Someone tell me. Say, someone say, say that he's a prophet and that he is not. He's not God, right? Uh, that he, uh, he uh, didn't die on the cross, uh, but he was a great prophet. In fact, m- most of Islam would cl- declare him to be, probably other than uh, Muhammad, the greatest prophet under Muhammad. Uh, bad news for them, he's not under Muhammad. How about Hinduism? Okay, What does Hinduism teach about Jesus? What do they declare about Jesus? Their pantheon of gods? Yeah, he uh, certainly uh, is a god within their pantheon, little G god, right? The Hindu pantheon of 330 million gods. But he's not unique as son of God or savior, that he was kind of an avatar or an incarnation of God or a, 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 some kind of manifestation. He was a great spiritual teacher, maybe even a guru, uh, but not a, uh, not a true god and certainly not our savior. How about Buddhism? What did Buddhism teach us about God? Or declare. Okay, he was humble, an insignificant prophet, right? A reformer who performed good deeds. I'm sorry, that's Judaism. Buddhism, a teacher, that's right, who, uh, who may have possessed Buddhahood or enlightenment. He's not unique. Judaism, what do they teach about Jesus? <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Yeah. That he was, that he was at best an insignificant prophet. He was a humble guy. He was a reformer. He did some good deeds. He's not the Messiah, and he is certainly not divine. In fact, the Judaism as it exists today, uh, Judaism as it exists today is not what the New Old Testament teaches us, uh, but Judaism as it exists today would consider it to be heresy uh, if you were to declare Jesus to be divine, that there's only one God, that they uh, deny the Trinity that the Bible clearly teaches, and uh, so Jesus is not God. Uh, and then, of course, there are these Christian cults who profess Christianity, agree about Jesus' life and work, but don't always agree about the nature of Jesus. Okay, And I know that the word cult uh, becomes I'm good, uh, very pejorative. Don't take it that way. Uh, cult is, a cult is a group. Uh, we didn't say a cult. We're not talking about demonic things necessarily, directly anyway. We're talking about a cult, and a cult is one that ad- uh, would be identified as having a different Savior or Jesus, even perhaps a different God and a different gospel. Okay, and, the, and we get that from the New Testament, right? That if one, uh, you know, come preaching any other gospel than we or an angel from heaven, uh, deliver, even if it be we or an angel from heaven, you're, what are you supposed to do with them? You're supposed to call them accursed, isn't that right? Or really have nothing to do with them. So we're not talking about standing at the front door yelling at people. Hey, you bunch of losers, get off my lawn. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the fact that we can't act like a false gospel is a legitimate gospel and that we're the same. Because we're not. And there's a different Jesus, right? And we're told in the New Testament about those who come preaching another Jesus. I'm just trying to review very quickly tonight because I do want to make progress. And, and there are those who, who uh, exist today. Uh, they're not bad people, uh, but their belief is absolutely flagrantly against the Bible, even if they would use the name of the Bible or a name from the Bible. And they do not believe that Jesus is the same Jesus. How many of us could agree on this? We learned it, so I hope we can. That if you make Jesus start without his God, his divinity, and then earn his divinity to become a God, you have a different Jesus than the Bible teaches. Okay? He's the Alpha and Omega. He's without beginning, without end. He is God. He will always be God, and he always has been God. He didn't progress from manhood to godhood, nor will you, by the way. Okay? You won't uh, progress till you get your own planet and um, 432 wives, which might be paradise. I don't know. I'm going to leave that one alone. Or if you say Jesus, we believe in Jesus, but he requires a helper to redeem us, a co-redemptress. Is that the Jesus of the Bible? No, see, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, period, end of conversation. 
And so you understand that there are those who would use the label Christianity and uh, we're not out to have an argument with them, although we will contend for the truth uh, in grace and truth. There are those who uh, believe that, uh, that Jesus was God's first creation. I wonder who the us was, who the us is in the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God, right? And it's a, a, that compound unity that's uh, seen there and taught throughout that time. And so there are these false views of Jesus held by those who are good people, perhaps, and religious, no doubt. We don't necessarily want to be any of those things just for the sake of being those things. Because the New Testament, as we learned a few weeks ago, declares a lot of different things about Jesus. Let me quickly refresh your memory. Uh, the, the New Testament, uh, Jesus declares uh, that uh, the Father revealed who he is, Matthew chapter 16, uh, verses 13 through 17. Uh, and uh, here's what he said uh, in Caesarea Philippi, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some say you're one of the prophets or you're John the Baptist. And uh, gave a list and he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter stood up and said this, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus' response to him was this, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which was in heaven. And so, uh, you know, Jesus uh, is declared uh, to be God uh, by the very Father, or God the Father. John 1, verses 1 through 14, uh, John reveals by inspiration the deity of Jesus of Nazareth, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says uh, that uh, the same was in the beginning with God, and, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the Bible just declares, the New Testament declares all of these truths uh, about Him, that uh, Hebrews chapter 1, that Jesus is the full revelation of God. Revelation uh, chapter 1 and really throughout that, uh, uh, that Jesus is eternal, that he has no end or no beginning. In uh, Matthew 3 17 he's called my beloved son by the father at his baptism. There's a voice from heaven that said this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. John chapter 10 and verse 30 we're just going over the notes from before but uh, uh, you know that he's one with the father. John chapter 6 and John chapter 14, if you've seen Jesus, you have seen the Father because Jesus declares the Father. He reveals the Father in all of his fullness and all of his things. And so the Bible declares who Jesus is, which is far different than what uh, is being declared by, uh, by, the, by the world and these false uh, cults and false beliefs. Hang on a second, I've got technical difficulties tonight. Maybe I will take that hand out. Do you still have it? Only happens when I don't need it to. Thank you, Josh. So I want you to take tonight's handout because I want to take it to the next step and really this is where we'll probably leave this uh, study and I know we have a short time tonight now but, uh, but we do know that, uh, that, uh, that many, uh, whoa, we know that many of the that, of the things that men say about Jesus are said to attempt to undermine his deity. That's my introduction, probably not your notes. Um, and we, we know that many want to deny the very uh, existence of Jesus Christ. So let me, let me remind you of this. Let me say this. We're just going to just go as quick as we can tonight. But if, if you and I are reaching out into the world around us, with the desire to help people know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Okay? Now, there's lots of things that go with that, isn't there? We know that when we see a brother in need and we say, be warmed and filled, how dwelleth the love of God in us? That there are certain times and opportunities that we need to make a real, even sacrificial effort to meet the needs of others physically around us. And we know that not everybody that sometimes gets help is going to make a spiritual decision, are they? Okay, That's really not in our wheelhouse. Our wheelhouse is to be faithful to do what we're supposed to do, trust the Lord. And even if we were to get taken advantage of and we try to be careful, uh, I think God is able to vindicate all of those things, don't you? And so uh, we know, though, that, that if you're reaching out and you're really trying to reach people in our day, I told you not long ago that the biggest uh, single uh, professing group religiously today in America are the nuns. 
okay? No affiliation. They're the fastest growing. I think I told you a, a couple of Sunday nights ago uh, this uh, statistic that, that it's uh, at the 75% mark of every generation, we'll say every, let's say, a class graduating out, okay? So it's not a 40-year generation, but of every sort of turnover, we'll call it the turnover in our youth department, let's say it that way, that 75% of those in uh, Bible-believing churches are leaving the faith. 75%. That's a, that's a dramatic, must-be-addressed statistic. 75% means this, huh? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Sorry, Sarah, you don't count as a teenager anymore. Seventy-five percent. Eight. Is that right? Nine. Nine. Out of twelve. Will be gone. So I said this to you, we're not willing to lose any of you. Not one of you. And it's not just gone from the faith, but that affects everything in your life as a family, but it's gone from the faith. And so if we're trying to reach out, you gotta know this, that you're gonna encounter people who are going to tell you that God is a myth, the Bible is a book of mythology, and that Jesus is not real and never existed, that he's made up by religious people to manipulate lives or something like that. I, I encounter it frequently. I tell you about it often uh, in uh, some of our outreach stuff that we do online. And we have people that are constantly, some of them get belligerent and ugly. We just delete them and, and uh, let them be. Some of them we have legitimate discussions with. But you got to know this, that there's a group out there, there that want to say Jesus never existed. And, and in doing that, to try to get you and I not to talk to them any longer. And so I told you we would talk about what uh, scholars call the historical Jesus. Is Jesus only evidenced in the Bible, or is there uh, other evidence that would, let's say, stand alongside the Bible? Now, let's be careful with this, because we believe that this is the truth without any admixture of error. And I'm here to tell you tonight that I don't really need anything more than this. I'm completely settled, you probably are, on who Jesus is, that he is God, God manifest in the flesh, that he's the Redeemer, and he's the eternal Son of the living God. Someone say amen tonight. But I would tell you that when we're uh, uh, trying to give an answer, that we have to at least be prepared to say, when someone goes, there's no evidence that Jesus ever existed, I think that we have to be a little bit prepared to say, well, let's, let's take a deeper look at that. Because there is evidence, okay? Not evidence that outweighs the Bible, but evidence that could stand alongside the Bible, particularly with those who won't, at least at the beginning, listen to anything the Bible has to say. So real quickly, on your paper, you have some historical evidence. I don't want to spend a lot of time in it. I just want to draw your name through it. Uh, there's some archaeological evidence, okay? Um, there are, there's evidence for the censuses, right? Uh, uh, Luke chapter 2, the story of the birth of Jesus, talks about, uh, about a census being called for and everyone needing to go back to their, uh, to their home uh, to be counted. And that's how Jesus and, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's how uh, uh, Mary and Joseph ended up in Bethlehem. They were of the tribe of Judah. That's where they were from. They ended up there. And of course, in order to deny Jesus, uh, there's a lot that try to make that not a thing. That they, that would never have happened. That they would never call for that. In fact, uh, during this time, there was a lot of uh, censuses. At least one every 14 years more often than that. And there is one that's described uh, uh, in an inscription, a Latin inscription called the uh, Titulus uh, Ven Venetus. And and it indicates that there was a census that took place in Syria and Judah around A.D. 5 to 6. And that it was typical uh, from uh, those held throughout the Roman Empire during the time of Augustus, Caesar Augustus, about 23 B.C. to A.D. 14. And, um, and that went on at least until the 3rd century A.D. Look, I'm not, I'm not trying to say this one thing proves everything in Scripture. In fact, we have evidence more than we have proof. But please understand this, that when someone would say to you, well, those senses weren't real, therefore Jesus is not real, the truth of history is that the senses were real. 
And that doesn't erase the truth about Jesus Christ. Everybody with me? It's, and it's just archaeological evidence, which, by the way, uh, archaeological evidence con constantly uh, reaffirms the Bible. There's another one on the uh, next uh, page. There was uh, uh, evidence for uh, the life of Christ uh, that we find in the crucifixion of Christ uh, in, uh, in a place called Johannan Crucifixion Vic uh, uh, victim outside of Jerusalem, uh, 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 just outside of the Damascus Gate, there was found in 1968 a, a burial site, and the burial site was from, of course, some time before that, and uh, and there 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 they found uh, a, a a young man who was uh, uh, crucified. In fact, let me read you just a little bit of that that if I could uh, tonight, I found it interesting, but I don't want to be boring up here tonight. Uh, in terms of our study, the most important discovery there was a man named Yohanan bin Haggal Gol. And uh, his name was written in Arabic on one of the uh, stone ossuaries there. And uh, he was, some description, he was 5 feet 7 inches in height, was about 24 to 28 years old, had a cleft palate and was a victim of crucifixion. Still piercing his feet was a large nail about 7 inches long that had been driven sideways through his heel bones, which indicates the direction in which the feet and legs were twisted in order to be attached to the cross. So how many of you have ever uh, like seen the pictures or heard someone say, well, it wasn't that bad. They just kind of tied them up there to the cross. And no, no, no. What the Bible says is true. They drove nails. I think seven inches long qualifies as ouch. Yes, at least. Uh, and uh, it says there was a nail, uh, the nail pierced an acacia, acacia, acacia beam on the other side to be attached to the cross. Uh, small pieces of wood were still attached to it. The end of the nail was built, uh, was bent backwards. There were nails uh, found that had pierced uh, through the bones in his hands as well, and uh, and one in the lower arm, uh, and uh, all of that. This and this man was discovered. His lower leg bones were broken. Uh, the left tibia and fibula bones and the right tibia bone were apparently crushed by a common blow, with the legs being sawed off at a later time. You say, preacher, why are you telling us all this stuff? Well. Because all the things they say aren't true about the biblical record of Jesus' crucifixion are supported by archaeological finds. Some would say they didn't crucify that way. They did crucify that way. Some would say they would never break the bones. Okay, They did break the bones. Jesus' bones were not broken, were they? Someone tell me why. What's that? He'd already, He'd already died and, and it was prophetic, wasn't it? Okay. So uh, understand that the way that Jesus was crucified is supported. And, and again, it's just this, that we're to be ready to give an answer uh, to every man who asketh the reason that lieth, for the hope that lieth in us. And the truth of that is, is that, you know, they will point to the crucifixion and say, never happened, never will, Jesus is fake. This is just one thing. We could find more. I don't want to take the time on any of it tonight, really. I want to get to where we're going. But I want you to know that archaeological uh, finds are constantly confirming the biblical record of Jesus Christ. There were coins uh, dated in about A.D. 30 to 31. Here's another thing that people say. Well, Pontius Pilate wasn't even the king at that time. He, he was long gone and, and uh, this time is fake and it can't be right and it's all off. Well, but there were coins found uh, in a dig near Temple Mount not long ago uh, that have Pontius Pilate as the uh, ruler in their area in A.D. 30 and 31. How many of you think that's fairly close to the biblical record tonight? Yeah. In fact, let's say so close that it's right on, right? That uh, it's all uh, just in that time frame. And so there is archaeological uh, evidence uh, that Jesus is real. Amen. That he really existed, that he was a real person. Now, here's what I want to tell you. We're really dealing with the minor opinion, but it's the one that's growing and often thrown at us in the United States of America. Most scholars today are settled on this. I mean, most legitimate scholars consider the idea that Jesus was not historical to be foolish. 
Okay? There's enough evidence that the, that the bulk of historical scholarship would say Jesus existed, he was born, he was crucified. Most wouldn't agree on the resurrection, uh, but, uh, but they would agree that he existed. But we're facing a people who are so often uh, antagonistic towards anything to do with God and Christianity that all of these things come at us all the time. There are also, very briefly, I don't want to again take a lot of time here, but there are ancient to non-Christian sources. And I have some listed there for you. A fellow by the name of Cornelius Tactus, Tacitus, right? A Roman historian who lived through the reigns of uh, over half a dozen, dozen emperors. In his writings, you have a quote there, uh, he references both Christianity uh, and a person named Christus. Okay, Christus is Christ. It is um, uh, sort of a different form of the word, but it is uh, Christ. Uh, and, uh, it, and it claims that he was the one that stirred up these Christians because they follow, him, follow Christus. There's another uh, uh, one by the name of Gaius uh, Suetonius. Another Roman historian, and, and uh, he also talks about this. There are a couple of quotes there on your uh, paper at the bottom of page two. Because the Jews at Rome caused continuous disturbances at the instigation of Christus, same really as Christus, he expelled them from the city. Why the Jews? I thought we were talking about Christians. Why the Jews? Why did he expel the Jews here? Why are they called the ones expelled? Because at this time, the majority of Christians were Jewish, Okay. It was after this, really, that the majority of Christians began through missionary enterprise to be Gentile. And the rabbinical Judaism stood up and began to really fight against the gospel amongst uh, Jewish people. But, but here it's clearly there that, that there's evidence, that's all it's saying, is that there's evidence in r ancient writings that Jesus was in fact a real being who had a real impact and that he really was here on earth. Jesus is a historical figure no matter what anyone wants to say about that. And there are others, Josephus. Now, we're all probably familiar with Josephus, one of the great uh, antiquity, uh, or I'm sorry, historians of that age. Uh, in his books on the antiquities, there's like 22 of them. Uh, there's a quote here from that, and simply this, that, uh, you know, uh, that identifying again that Jesus was real, that he existed in that day. And the last one on your paper, on page three, is the Talmud. How many of you know what the Talmud is? The Talmud is a strictly Jewish writing, okay? So it's made up of two parts, the Mishnah, some of this supposed to be some of the oral law. We talked about that some time back. That's not a real thing. And then the Gemara, which is sort of a commentary on that. Uh, they'll call it the wisdom of the sages. It's the wisdom of the rabbis, wisdom in quotes. And they uh, put all of this. There's a, a Babylonian and a, and a Jerusalemi uh, Talmud. But it is the, re the writings of this. And this is what they say. Though they would deny Jesus as a savior, they don't deny his existence. And they talk here in this quote that's on your paper about this man, Yeshu, that's Jesus uh, in Hebrew, was hanged on the eve of the Passover. Okay, And how uh, they planned it and prepared for it and that, uh, that uh, he went through it because no one stood up to defend him. But you cannot take the writings of the Jews who deny Jesus and deny that Jesus existed. That's the point tonight. Okay, That Jesus is a historical figure. Now, very quick, very surface, but you have enough setting in front of you tonight to say to someone, no, that's not true. Because there's both archaeological and ancient writings, just historical information, not from Christians. Josephus was not a Christian. You may have heard his name enough that you thought he was. No, no, no. He was not at all a Christian. He was a Jewish man and very, uh, very entrenched in that. Okay, none of these historians were Christians. Many of them were Roman pagans, okay, that we read tonight. And yet from that, from that arena, we get consistent evidence that Jesus existed. We talked about who he was last time, that he was very God, amen, that he was the revealer of the Father. He and the Father were one. All of the things we reviewed quickly tonight. But you need to know this tonight, that anyone that says, well, Jesus was made up, he didn't exist that's a lie. And the evidence, the evidence of history proves it to be otherwise. But the most important evidence is biblical evidence. Because biblical evidence is that the Gospels 
I'll remind you, were completed by about 90 A.D. And I need you to underline that or highlight that, and I need you to keep that in your mind. Because one of the great things that is used to attack both Jesus and Christianity is this, that the Gospels were not eyewitness accounts. In fact, some of those who deny even the historical existence of Jesus, they say that uh, these things came a couple of hundred years after Jesus' supposed time on earth, and there would be no evidence, and none of these uh, eyewitness accounts could be trusted. You need to know that the, the best evidence of the, of the antiquity or the age when the Gospels were written is that really they were, I think Luke uh, probably, the first one was done in the late 50s, okay, within 20 years or a little over of the time of Jesus. And all of them were done by A.D. 90, okay, uh, not sometime out in the first century or second century. I mean, uh, they're right there. And so here's what that means, that there were lots, most eyewitnesses of the life and ministry of Jesus who were there when these things were written and reading them. So get this, if you were an eyewitness of all of this and someone produced this document and said, here's the story of Jesus, and you were there, you would go like, shh. They would be, they, those things would not exist today. And yet of all documents of antiquity, and we gave you some stuff on this a few months ago, but of all documents in antiquity, there is more uh, fragments and evidence for the, for the Bible than any document, I mean not more by a little, more by five miles uh, evidence that the Bible was there and that, of course, it's been preserved and it's reliable. And so uh, the, uh, the, there is a great record in the Gospels. And the Bible record shows, the biblical record shows, that Paul is, was a contemporary of the Gospel writers. Now you've got to get this down. Because those especially who would deny the historical fact of Jesus want to take Paul's writings and say, well, he knew nothing about Jesus. He was not a contemporary with anybody. In fact, Jesus may have come hundreds of years before Paul, and he's just uh, making all of this up for religious purposes. That's not at all like the Paul, Saul, Paul of the Bible, uh, but it's not at all what the Bible says. So I want you uh, to go, we're going to go to uh, just a couple of passages tonight. And I know that we're right at the end of our time. But I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We have to understand these things, church, because we are being and should be. In fact, I'm going to give you a homework assignment right now. Your job is to talk to enough people about Jesus that one of them tells you that either God doesn't exist, the Bible's a myth, or Jesus is not real. And come back and tell us about it. You've got a week shouldn't be that hard. Maybe a little over. We cannot let our Christianity be an academic exercise. We learn to be equipped to go out and to declare truth to a lost and dying world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, of course, you know that Paul declares what the gospel is in the first five verses. Uh, I, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, uh, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which ye are uh, saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, uh, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve. And after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James and then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, for I, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. I wish you had more time tonight, because I'd like to camp right there and tell you that no matter how far you've gone, God is willing to redeem you and and use you for his glory. You may have completely wasted your life, broken your life. You may have completely made a mess out of it and think there's no hope for me. Oh, there's hope for you because Jesus is real, was then and is now and he will redeem you and turn you around. But I'd like you to notice this, that, uh, that his gospel declaration tells us that he was a contemporary 
with those who wrote. It talks about Peter here, right? How we delivered that uh, uh, which I was given, how that he was seen of Cephas and above the twelve. And, uh, and, and you say, well, that doesn't mean that Paul was. Well, well I understand that, but if you, uh, if you go into the book of Galatians with me real quickly, uh, we can solve the idea that, well, that doesn't mean that Paul and, and Peter were contemporaries. I think it does. Uh, Galatians chapter number one, uh, the Bible says this, Galatians chapter number one, and and uh, verse number 18 and 19, this is after uh, uh, Peter, well, actually, let's back up a little bit. Uh, let's uh, say this, that uh, verse 15 and 16 uh, is where Peter gets saved. 17 says he didn't go to Jerusalem, didn't go to the apostles before me, which were before me, but went to Arabia and returned unto Damascus. Uh, they call that Paul's time in Bible college. I wouldn't call it that. That was Paul alone with the Lord, verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Okay, let's see if we can solve this issue. Was Peter contemporary with Paul or Paul contemporary with Peter? Was he? I mean, if they stayed together for 15 days, I'm fairly certain that didn't mean he went out into a Jewish graveyard and laid by Peter's tomb and said, what's up, bro? Okay, I'm pretty sure that didn't happen. Okay. Of course they stayed together. And he was a contemporary uh, of them. He, they visited early in that time. And uh, uh, in verses 18 and 19, but, the, uh, but other of the apostles I saw none save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, uh, before God I lie not. And so he saw Peter and James the brother of the Lord. They're all referenced very clearly. Of course, James the brother of the Lord would have to have been a contemporary with the Lord. Someone say amen. amen. And if he was a contemporary with the Lord, he would have been a contemporary with all of the apostles, though he didn't believe at that time. But the time of his life would have been contemporary, right? And if Paul went and met with him, then you can't separate between Paul's life and the other apostles by any degree at all. The only separation you can make is when he began to fill the office of apostle. And that's different than them to a degree. He went back 14 years later in Galatians chapter 2. After 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, took Titus uh, with me. I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of the false brethren unawares brought in who came in to privily spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, and that, that they might bring us uh, into bondage. To who we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But those, uh, one of those that seemed to be somewhat, whoever they were and maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they uh, who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me as the gospel of the circumcision was to Peter, for he that wrought effectively in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision was the same was the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Now listen to this. Then James, Cephas, and John. They're there 14 years later when, when uh, Paul goes back to Jerusalem. Now he lists John. John who? John the Apostle. Okay? And others who seem to be pillars. All I'm telling you tonight is we know that the Bible really, some would debate this, is the greatest a history book, certainly of, of eschological history or Jewish history even, uh, that exists in the world. And uh, here we have a span of 14 years and you still have them. They're still there. They're still alive. They're still contemporaries. Paul is now the apostle to the Gentiles and, uh, and uh, Peter, uh, of course, to the circumcision. And, uh, and they're certainly contemporaries. To say that Jesus is not real because none of the facts could be real, because these people were separated and not together, is not able to be supported by Scripture. 
And the Bible tells us different. In fact, we know in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm sorry, uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 11, we finished reading there, it says this, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain of, uh, came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, and when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Do you think that Peter and Paul were contemporaries here and that they uh, ministered together? There was even a conflict between them, but where were they? They were not now in Jerusalem, they're now in Antioch. This is Antioch of Syria, okay, uh, where, uh, where uh, Paul really began and from which his uh, missionary journeys took uh, place. And there they are and, uh, and visit him there. The requirements for an apostle make it clear that they all had to be contemporaries. Someone tell me the biblical requirements for an apostle. Huh? Go ahead. Okay, uh, go, go uh, with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9 real quickly. We'll be done in just a couple of minutes. Sorry, long review tonight. So he's clearly an apostle, verse 1. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yea, doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. Now quickly go up to the book of Acts in chapter number 1 or back to the book of Acts in chapter 1. Because now they're looking to replace Judas Iscariot. And they say this, sorry i got to go back a little further. Acts chapter number 1, we find out what's required of a man to be an apostle, right? And so it says this in verse number 18. Uh, is that what I want? No, verse 21, okay. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out amongst us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be witness with us of his resurrection. We know that it's required for the office of apostle. There are no apostles today like these apostles. There are those who claim that title, but there are none because they would have had to have seen Jesus during his earthly ministry. The apostle Paul did see Jesus. And he was contemporary both with Jesus, with all of the twelve, and uh, certainly with Peter. And we know of Paul's timing. Uh, to the office of the apostle. 1 Corinthians 15, that great uh, book that we read out of concerning the gospel, but that same chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about him being one out of due season, okay? One out of due season. Uh, verse 7 and 8 of chapter 15 said this, I say, after that he was seen of James and then of all the apostles, that's Jesus, and last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time for I am the least of the apostles and I'm not me to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And so uh, Paul's timing was he became an apostle after the other apostles, right? He persecuted them. They were the foundation stones, Christ being the chief cornerstone of the church that Jesus founded. And Paul, then Saul persecuted them. And then he becomes out of due season or after them an apostle to the Gentiles. Okay, his timing makes it clear that he was a contemporary with with all of them, including Jesus Christ. And Paul goes off the scene by about late A.D. 50, maybe early 60 at the latest. He's not even here when the temple is destroyed, nor are the rest of them except John, because they've been mostly martyred and they're all dead, and they're all contemporaries. So why all of this? Go, preacher, ugh, that was hard. I'm sorry it was hard. But you need to be prepared to give an answer. And if you're trying to reach people, you will be confronted that Jesus' claims are false claims. Claims about Jesus are mythical. And you need to be prepared to give an answer to that. Jesus is real. Listen to this. He lived in the first century. And he lives today. And he offers life. And we're the agency 
through which he spreads the message of life. If we don't tell it, it doesn't get told. And it is under attack, always has been. We're not victims, we're victors in Jesus Christ. But we do need to be ready to give an answer when someone says that Jesus is a big fraud. Is Jesus a big fraud? I know you knew that coming in, but I want you to be prepared to meet them on the field of intellectual battle and spiritual battle and give an answer to every man that asketh the reason for the hope that lieth in you. And our hope is a living Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, thank you for our time. I pray you'd help us. I pray you'd help us, Lord, uh, to be equipped, to be bold, to be humble, uh, and Lord, to be diligent about, about declaring truth, living truth, and being ready to give an answer to everyone that asketh the reason for the hope that lies in you. Thank you for sending your Son. Thank you for redeeming us, Father. Thank you for loving us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And take some time to pray. I think let's.